fisherman tumbling on the seas far away from dry land and its bitter memories casting out my sweet life with a band of none that love The world is running out of seafood and running out soon. Exactly 42 years from now, in the year 2048, there will be nothing left to fish in oceans. That's the precise and dire conclusion of a major new study released today by the journal Science. Fish in the sea. Can we undo the damage before they're all gone? Clam bakes, crab cakes, and even fish sticks could one day be a thing of the past. Oh my god, the fish are dying. <laughs> a new report says if current trends of overfishing and pollution continue, all seafood could be wiped out in 40 years and not just ocean life. Ecologists are also worried about fish in lakes and rivers. Experts say it's not too late to turn things around. They're calling for new marine reserves, better management to prevent overfishing, and tighter controls on pollution. That's what kills me about mass media news. Horrors never before known can be reported in those news voices, followed immediately by the trivial, as though the disappearance of fish in the sea is just another story. Personally, I thought this woman's reaction was a little more realistic. Oh my god! I can't believe it! Ah! I had no idea! A homophobic preacher admits hiring a gay prostitute? Now that is interesting. Everyone is clicking to find out more. The end of seafood? Not so much. These days, notice I did not say in these end times, environmental news requires a horror soundtrack with cues for when we should cry out or scream. I suppose that's part of the mission of Radio Ecoshock. As if predictions about the demise of the coral reef weren't, weren't bad enough, scientists also predict most of the world's fisheries are set to collapse in just over 40 years. A combination of overfishing and pollution are being blamed for the problem. Scientists from Canada's Dalhousie University led the international study, basing their findings on almost 8,000 species fished over the past 50 years. Moan now. Oh no. This is Alex Smith, and we're taking a quick tour through the latest horror flick known as reality. The essential facts are these. In the May 2003 issue of the journal Nature, two scientists from Canada's maritime provinces released their study, Rapid Worldwide Depletion of Predatory Fish Communities. Their research showed that 90% of all large fish, the upper tier of predators, were already gone. Fish like tuna, marlin, swordfish, sharks, cod, and halibut. And they found it only takes 10 to 15 years for industrialized fishing to grind down any new stock to 10% of the original population. The few big fish that are left are noticeably smaller, one-fifth to one-half the size caught by previous generation. The authors also called for a global effort to reduce the impacts of fishing, including fewer fishing boats, reduced bycatch, an end to government subsidies where they pay for all these boats, and for the most threatened species, cutting the catch in half. Little was done. Norman Meyer said, We are in a massive denial and continue to bicker over the last shrinking numbers of survivors, employing satellites and sensors to catch the last few fish left. We have to understand how close to extinction some of these populations really are, and we must act now before they reach the point of no return. I want there to be hammerhead sharks and bluefin tuna around when my five-year-old son grows up. If present fishing levels persist, these great fish will go the way of the dinosaurs. End quote. We are the dinosaur. We don't live here anymore. We got what we were asking for. The whole world's dialing 911. The don't walk sign just changed to you better run. What we've been waiting for has long since come. 
All right, in late October 2006, Dr. Worm was again the lead author in a major study by 14 scientists from Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States, Panama, and Australia. Institutions like Stanford University, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and Stockholm University were participating. It is titled Impact of Biodiversity Loss on Ocean Ecosystem Services and published in the journal Science for November 3rd. The team analyzed mountains of data about fish catches from around the world going back 50 years and even cross-checked against historical records up to a thousand years old. Dr. Worm couldn't believe the computer analysis and so cross-checked the results by hand. And uh, I saw that the trend of collapse of seafood species projected into the future predicts that by the year 2050 there will be no more species left to fish and I really recall the hair standing up in the back of my neck and a shiver down my spine as I watched over the students and I thought it's going to be in all of your lifetime and in my lifetime too I'm going to be old but still I will see this happen if nothing changes if we don't change the way we're treating ocean ecosystems. In a moment of disbelief the figure showed that about 29 percent of the world's edible fish were already in a collapsed state by 2003. That's over 2,200 edible species no longer commercially viable. If humans continue to harvest ocean resources at the current rate while polluting the sea and the atmosphere, the graph of fish population drops to nothing around the year 2048. The report was cross-checked by an array of the world's top fishery scientists, but it is common knowledge that we're fishing out the sea. Report after report has showed it. More and more areas are close to fishing, including the record-setting end of the great 500-year-long cod fishery off Canada's east coast. According to the study, species below 10% of their original size include many types of salmon, king crab, some scallops and oysters, tuna, trout, shrimp, sharks, and more. All of this comes as diet-challenged first-worlders are being advised to eat lots more fish to get those omega-3 fatty acids so important as brain food. The study also showed the importance of biodiversity. Ocean life is very interlinked, with special services rendered by both small and large organisms. When part of that natural mechanism is removed, the whole breaks down, and the speed of decline is increasing year by year. That is true. We see that in the ocean, species are very strongly connected, probably more so than on land. For example, if you remove a large predator species like a shark or maybe codfish, you see a domino effect of cascading ecosystem effects down the food chain. This is something we not see as commonly on land. So we have to rethink for the ocean. We have to envision this as a house of cards where every element of this building is integral to the structure of the whole. What has accelerated is that it's many more people who depend on wild resources like fish and seafood, but also the industrial scale at which we're scooping up species from the ocean, the global scale at which we're operating now. There is no ocean region that is exempt from our impacts. Only 1% of the ocean or less is protected effectively from fishing. Not all scientists agree with the paper's results, and some fishing nations have gone on the offensive against such dire conclusions. For one thing, even the authors admit they hope to stimulate public concern to head off the problem before seafood disappears forever. Worm and his team of scientists want fisheries to be managed for sustainable yields, with real control over sources of ocean pollution, better maintenance of habitat, and big ocean reserves. Like the recent Stern report on climate, these scientists say such moves are an investment in a livable future with real economic payoffs if we act, and greater, almost unimaginable, penalties if we go on with business as usual. More than a billion people depend on seafood as their main source of protein, not to speak of the ocean's great value in itself. After all, all these species have a right to exist without us coming around to collect them in nets or throwing them overboard as bycatch. Worm says, it's not too late. We can turn this around. It's really important to notice that our analysis had a strong upside, and that is, wherever people have tried to reverse the loss of biodiversity through protective measures, they've usually been successful, and they've been successful within a relatively short time period, usually three to five to ten years. But less than one percent of the global ocean is effectively protected right now. He gives better management marks for stocks off the North Pacific, on Alaska, as an example of how fishing can be done sustainably. 
Sadly, though, most of the rest of the world is becoming depleted and fast. For example, here in Atlantic Canada, um, fishing has been going on for 500 years or more, and groundfish stocks after that long history finally collapsed in the early 90s. There has been no directed fishery at these species so far, and so this is 12 years, and there has been very little or no recovery over time. The problem there is that we really don't know how to fix it. We're not good at repairing something that doesn't recover on its own. We don't have a technological fix. We can't just replant things like we do on land. We don't know how to do that in the ocean. So we really rely heavily on the ability of the system to self-repair, to recover on its own. And what we show in this analysis is that that ability of the system to self-recover, self-repair, is tied very strongly into its biodiversity, the number of species in the system. I think we still take the recovery potential of the ocean for granted. We think if you collapse it, it's going to come back. That's what they thought in Newfoundland. That was what they thought over here. And that should be a strong warning to European countries that it actually can happen that it collapses beyond a point of return where it doesn't recover on itself. And as I said, we don't know how to engineer a solution in that case. Nilish Gundar, a spokesman for Greenpeace Australia, says ocean pirates are stealing up to $9 billion U.S. worth of fish a year from some of the world's poorest people. Greenpeace is calling for 40% of the oceans to become protected reserves to save the world's seafood. So is it in fact a war on fish you're yes. describing? It, it certainly is a war on fish and what I'm saying is that we're winning it. We have won the war on fish. And we're so going to wipe them out, the very gonna... last one. <laughs> that is, it's crazy but it is exactly what's happened. We have deployed industrial military technology against the fish and we have obviously won. The biggest fish have brains the size of peas. And the way they defend themselves against their enemies by hiding or swimming fast, etc., to us, they don't make much of a difference anymore. Before they did, if a fish could hide between rocks at 1,000 meter depth, then you couldn't catch it, you couldn't see it, obviously. It was too deep. And even if you could reach that deep with your net, you couldn't catch it because it was between rocks. But now we can see it because we have all the equipment to see it. So we see it ridiculously, like a, a soldier who has night goggle who can see somebody who doesn't, right? And so we, we win. We win the war against fish. Professor Daniel Pauly is head of fisheries at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Just recently, the United Nations is trying to implement a ban on one of the most destructive fishing practices, trawling of the deep seabed, often compared to clear-cutting on land. To its international shame, Canada is one of the few countries opposing the ban, even when Canadian scientists are warning of an end to global fisheries. The same kind of protect-the-jobs thinking by Canadian politicians led to the total collapse of one of the richest fisheries in the world, the East Coast Cod. Even with new ocean protection measures, events on land are also damaging ocean life. Deforestation cuts into marine weather cycles as well, and of course global warming impacts fish and all ocean life. Some marine testing stations in Canada have measured an increase of more than 4 degrees in the ocean temperature. And carbon dioxide from coal plants and vehicles is making the ocean more acidic, hampering the development of tiny sea creatures and coral that support ocean life. Doctors Worm and Myers have also written papers on managing fisheries during climate change. That's something you're going to hear more about as warmer waters power up the hurricanes and fresher waters dilute climate-regulating ocean mechanisms like the Gulf Stream. Extinctions of whole ocean ecosystems are possible if they cannot adapt to rapid temperature change. We see the end of the line. Uh, we see where this trend, which is a very strong trend, is heading. If we go on like we did over the last 50 years, there will be no viable fisheries left within our lifetimes. Even scientists have leaks to the media these days. An email to colleagues went to the Seattle Times by mistake. In it, Dr. Worm hoped that his projection of ocean death would serve as, quote, a news hook to get people's attention. One reason why nobody cares about marine biodiversity, he continued, is that there seems to be no clear end in sight. Well, it's time to wake up. If the current trend continues, we will see drastic consequences in our own lifetime, end quote. This report certainly got my attention, despite lame efforts to cover it by mass media news outlets. I hope it got yours too. 
I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock, the Nets only all environment radio station at www.ecoshock.org. Voice clips are from the Today Show on BBC4 and from ABC National in Australia. We had music snippets opening with the Waterboys tune Fisherman's Blues, a snatch from Bob Holman's We Are the Dinosaur, and ending with the Marvelettes classic Too Many Fish in the Sea, a common expression until now. We've turned the Serengetis in the world's oceans into deserts, and we didn't even know it.